Thanks for listening to the Pioneer Made to Grow podcast. I'm Andrew Campbell, and on today's episode, we cover the number one issue I think growers in Western Canada are facing today. It's a question every farmer worries about, and it's what to do in a drought. Obviously, parts of Western Canada have been dry for too long now, facing conditions that would leave every grower wondering what's the best course of action to try to balance growing a profitable crop with trying to keep costs down in case the rain doesn't come. And especially as growers today are looking at seed selection and trying to determine if they need to change up their crop rotation, we thought the best course of action was to try to bring in two experts to talk about growing crops in a drought. Derwin Hammond is an area agronomist with Pioneer in Manitoba. Jenny Seward is an independent agronomist out of Foremost, Alberta with her company Cronkite Ag Consulting. Derwin, Jenny, thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me. Glad to be Thanks here. Thanks for asking me. What a timely, timely topic. <laughs> well, you know what it is? It is a timely topic because it's one of those things where, you know, as we brainstorm, you know, what's an important issue that we can bring to growers, um, you know, in different parts of the country. Drought is the number one conversation point. It's the number one issue going into 2024. Like it, it can't help but be the number one thing on the top of Western Canadian growers minds. And so to be able to talk about this, I think is is very timely and a very important issue. So I appreciate both of you, um, you know, jumping on to kind of walk through what I see as, uh, you know, let's let's plan out not necessarily worst case scenarios, but pl let's plan out if conditions stay dry, what can we do through the growing season? And we're going to start right now with, you know, we, we've just got to pick what we're planting. What is going in what acre around a farm? Um, you know, Derwin, you're talking to growers now, you know, what, what's kind of on the top of their mind in terms of what their, you know, seeding plan looks like going into 2024 and what could it look like? Well, here in southwestern Manitoba, we have a bit more diverse mix. So certainly lots of cereals and canola, but also some soybeans and corn. And our season last year, we had kind of a dry June, July, and then a bit of timely moisture later in the season that favored the yields on some of those longer season uh, crops and some of the later maturing hybrids on the canola side of things. So... Um, heading into this year, you know, one of the questions I often get is around rotation and uh, often comes up more on the corn side of things. It's kind of viewed as using a lot of moisture, um, but that's driven by the fact that it produces a lot of bushels. So from an efficiency standpoint, it's actually one of the more efficient crops in terms of moisture use efficiency. And so I often use that as the example of, you know, we have that rotation in place on our farm for a reason from a risk management standpoint, not just around drought, but also around, you know, drought and different rooting structures of the different crops and, and pulling from different depths and that kind of thing, but also from disease management, a lot of other uh, stresses that the crop may face throughout the season. So it's just kind of encouraging guys not to maybe abandon that long-term strategy completely uh, because of the potential that things may be dry uh, heading into this, this coming season. What about for you, Jenny, in terms of, you know, kind of that, you know, your part of the world in Alberta, you know, is it, a, is it the same thing? Is it, is it, do you abandon certain crops or is it a case of, you know, it probably is kind of the same plan you might have in previous years? You know, and, and that's absolutely it is, you know, it's, it's amazing how different our springs can be from one year to the next. Um, last spring we went in we were a month late seeding because it was so wet we had so much moisture um so i would say overall our our rotations and the crop diversity looked amazing um where as it's it's trying now we've you know we've we don't have soil moisture at this point in time we've got a little bit on the top um so it is it's that let's remember the long-term goals of our farm um, cutting a crop like canola um, for us because the yield isn't as good is is maybe that's a savings you know short term you know but long term you know we're in wireworm and, and wheat stem sawfly country 
um, you know, where that rotation piece, um, you know, and like Derwin brought up about, about rooting structure, you know, we need those, those tap rooted, um, crops that can, that can access, you know, not only moisture that's maybe down, down below on certain years, but nutrients, um, you know, so, so maintaining that the best, you know, crop rotation that I, that I love when I sit down with growers to plan, you know, okay, what are we doing this year is, well, you know, a little bit of everything um, always looks good to me because we, we just don't know how the year is going to turn out. So um, not having those, those pendulum swings, I guess, in, in acreage, you know, I'm going all this or all that um, and just, you know, keeping our long-term goals in mind, you know, um, really seems to, to help, right, for long-term long -term purposes. Well, and, and I can imagine, you know, in, in a situation like this, it's, you, you know, you feel like it could continue to drag on for a while, but, but at some point that rain comes and you're, you're not going to know whether it is going to be early in this growing season, later in this growing season, a different growing season, but it, it, it would seem that to have that balance, at least you're kind of just mitigating some of that risk for either tough conditions or wet conditions. You know, and so much so much goes into that right is is we just we just don't know then in terms of you know derwin when when you are looking through and you know say a grower is going to kind of keep that balance in terms of acres um you know what one of the things you, you've got to plan then is on the fertility side you know leading up to seeding um what's a fertility plan look like in this situation because if if I'm going based on what I maybe got last year, which was not fantastic, um, is is that the fertilizer plan I should be putting down? Should I be hoping for the best and putting everything I can at it? What What's a fertility plan look like? What do you tell a grower? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of focusing on your farm and, and what has that average looked like over, I would say, recent years. So the last, you know, five to 10 years um, um, just so that, you know, you've gone through some of those cropping sequences on the farm uh, for whatever crop you're talking about um, on those acres. Um, I think uh, generally speaking, I encourage guys to stick with at least shooting for an average yield, maybe slightly above um, as kind of a strategy. Um, looking towards that, where I think the opportunity may come for areas that were dry this past year is really uh, focusing in on getting some of that soil testing done and uh, utilizing that. We may have more residual in some of those soils than we think, not just for nitrogen, but for other key nutrients as well. And understanding what that looks like at a field level can really help you uh, tailor that fertility plan and in some cases maybe save uh, some significant cost. So then Jenny, it sounds like, you know, based on that theory, you know, you, you go into a season like this and you think, okay, I got to start to cut costs and maybe you think soil sampling is the one to cost. It sounds like maybe that's the one to definitely not cost if there may be some residual nutrients in the soil for you. So that's the thing. If, if we've been, you know, and certainly in, in my neck of the woods, we've been, we've been fertilizing optimistically, you know, for a good year. Um, and then we've, we haven't been, been getting those. So what is, you know, what are our residual numbers? What do they look like? You know, where, where to me, and it's funny that I say this because I, soil sampling is one of the services I provide. So I'm charging you for it, but to me, soil sampling can be some of the cheapest information you get on your farm. Um, where, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna fertilize my canola crop with this blend over this many acres and this many fields. Where, oh, you know, this field here has, you know, a ton of residual nitrogen where I can really cut that back. Fertilizing for an average year. Um, but oh, this this land I picked up, you know, five years ago that I'm renting is is still, you know, borderline deficient. Um, so to me, drought maybe is is one of the times where you know a soil test can can give you some pretty good information where 
you know, where are we going next year? Can we cut, um, you know, and, and, and give you that, that direction to, to go in? Because have you seen, I mean, I'm assuming you're, you're working through those soil samples right now going into 2024. Have you seen growers be surprised with what their nutrients are and, and maybe they can find some savings that they didn't expect? You know, ab- absolutely. We, we, yeah, we have our fingers crossed and we hope that, you know, we've got some good residual nitrogen numbers. Um, but yeah, I'll give the example of, of one farm I, I soil sampled for this past fall, um, you know, he had, he had purchased his, his fertilizer in August. Um, what he usually purchases for, you know, it was, it was a good price. So he, he locked it in. Um, you know, so we're sitting there going over the soil samples and, uh, you know, we still, he's still, he's not cutting any, any certain crops out of his rotation. Um, and he's still fertilizing for an average, um, average for our area and he said Jenny uh, I can cancel three super B loads of urea um, so that's that's pretty pretty significant you know in a year where you know my cost for for soil sampling was a fraction of of, of the savings so he you know he's he's pretty excited about that and it's it's one of those things I, I think it sometimes we we assume we, we assume we have more there in the soil. We assume we have less, um, you know, and that's that's one of the big pieces of agronomy is is don't assume, you know, let's get hard numbers and, and actual data and, and use that to our advantage. Well, I like how we've kind of started this out because it seems like we're, you know, reducing the risk in the areas we can. So it's, you know, in terms of, you know, what what we're actually planting, we're reducing the risk by, you know, kind of spreading that out in terms of crops, you know, cost of fertility. We can reduce some of that just by doing a soil sample. Um, but then we actually pull into the field and this is kind of the go time. And and we don't know what the conditions necessarily are going to look like, but let's, let's imagine that it stays droughty here. Let's imagine that things are dry Derwin um what are we what are we going to do to start like are we are we even going to bother to go in the field or what are the things we have to lay out to make that decision and and give the crop at least the best chance it can even if it is dry well I think one of the key things um is just in terms of being prepared having your equipment ready to do a a really precise and effective job of positioning that seed in in the soil profile. Uh, If we do need to see that kind of the deeper depths of whatever safe range of planting is it is for that crop, Uh, but thinking about canola, a small seeded crop where if we have to push down to two inches, we just know we're we're losing uh, plant population and and, uh, losing out on some seed survival as we push deeper. But the deeper you go, uh, the more precise you can be across that that planting unit in terms of from row to row and and front to back and all of those things can help ensure that we get an adequate plant population established across across the full width of that planter and across the full landscape of that field and that's going to create less openings for for later challenges with regard to weed control and and some of those challenges that are going to come up later in the season. So being effective with that. The other thing that will often come up is questions around uh, seeding rate. And so obviously, if you're pushing deeper, um, that survival rate's not likely going to be quite as good. But the flip side is often growers will think, well, I don't want too much competition among those crop plants for that that scarce uh, water resource if I'm in a drought situation. That said, um, if we go too low with those those targets, then we just create openings again for that weed competition to compete with that crop. So I'd rather see a bit of competition from other crop plants than, than a lot of competition from weeds later on in the growing season. Jenny, what, what else do we have to think of at seeding time? I think, yeah, I echo a lot of what, what Derwin said is, is just making sure that, you know, that one chance we get to put, to put everything in the ground and and do this, you know, we've got, we've got everything dialed in that, 
you know, we've done the best, you know, to our abilities. Um, we've got huge seating equipment out here, um, large acreages, um, you know, a 76 foot drill is, is everything working properly on that drill? You know, do we have everything calibrated properly? Um, something I see, especially on, on canola acres out here is, is we tend to seed maybe a little on the fast side where, you know, we've, we've really seen where slowing that drill down, um, you know, the, the accuracy goes up and our, our plant stand, you know, our, our emergence counts correspond with that. So really taking a look at how fast am I traveling over this field with what, you know, whatever the crop is, am I, am I doing a good job, um, at that? And, you know, for, for any other crop, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of farms around here will grow, you know, a couple different types of lentils, a couple different types of spring wheat durum, um, so really taking into account those those thousand kernel weights, counting them out, having them weighed out. We do a really good job on canola because in our area it's, you know, it's an expensive crop to grow. It can be an expensive crop to grow, but we need it for for the rotation of, you know, the long-term management of our land, but sometimes we overlook, you know, the cereal cereal crops where you know, we can have a 10% difference in, in thousand kernel weight. And so if you're seeding those crops at the same, you know, 90 pounds or, or whatever you set the drill at, it can make a big difference in, in plant establishment. And, um, you know, I'm also lucky because we're from Kosha and Russian thistle country where those weeds proliferate in, in hot, dry conditions where if we have that open canopy, um, you know, and we, we don't have a competitive crop because we, you know, chose to, to maybe scale back on the seeding rate, you know, that can, that can come to, to bite us sometimes. So really paying attention, you know, and just remembering, you know, we've got one chance to do this. Let's, let's do it right. Yeah, and that one chance, you know, it is one of those situations of going into that. Maybe maybe you're not overly optimistic going into it, and you and you still do anyway. You, it, it, it's hard to maybe get in that mindset of okay, we've got to make sure everything is as it should be. Everything is perfected so that it does have the best chance. And it it sounds like in a year like this, it it is as important as ever to make sure that all of those things are checked off, Derwin. Yeah. For sure, and you, you could argue even more critical just because likely you will be seeding that, that bit deeper if the dry conditions. And so the more stress you put on those emerging seedlings, it really exposes those mistakes. They they come to fruition and, and translate into reduced populations, and you will see it after the fact. So um, taking the time, and taking the time to be prepared that when field conditions are right, you can get out in the field and, and get into that, that planting operation and take advantage of whatever spring moisture you have to work with. Uh, that's also important. Well, that's, that's a good point, Derwin. And so Jenny, from a, from a timing perspective, what do you, what do you think is the right timing going into it? Is it, is it earlier is better in a year like this? Is it later and wait for some moisture? Like what, what do you offer your clients up for information? That's a really good question um, because we're known in, in 40 Mile County, you know, we, we kind of push the envelope because typically we, you know, we are drier. So, you know, we're often out in the field seeding, you know, first there's, there's still a bit of snow on the ground kind of thing. So we do, we have pushed that envelope, but um, you know, there, there is the odd conversation where, well, geez, it's, it's so dry. Do I wait for moisture? Um, and that's that's something that that we don't um, we don't see an advantage to here is is um, you know is is paying attention to that critical growth period of our crops you know so that we're we're not stressing them out with the with the July heat um, those 33, 30, 30 degree temperatures you know you know they make they make a big difference so we kind of um, you know, we go, if we can, you know, we're, we're going early um, and, you know, and then hope, hope to catch some rain, 
you know, on the flip side versus waiting, waiting for that moisture. Now, you mentioned, Jenny, how lucky you were to have kosha, which is maybe not the phrase that I would use if I had kosha, but I'll, I'll leave it with that, that how lucky you were to have kosha. So it, so it actually it, it actually translates nicely into the next part of this, because, okay, we've got, we've chosen the seed, we've got the, fer- the fertility down, we've got, um, you know, we've gone in and planted, now we're in season. And you know that the, the next question then is, is is how do we how do we handle this? Is it a case of we just go out and blanket treat um, you know spray kind of everything we would normally? Um, you know you, you said Kosha obviously loves the conditions. Um, you know how how do we handle some of these? So so really from an in season perspective, what are some of the ways that we can properly manage a crop that you know that, that that's often going? has some potential but you know we're, we're still in pretty dry conditions yeah so so that's that's the thing is kosha has has upped the ante if you will um because it's you know it's we it's now confirmed for resistant to four uh herbicide groups um so it's it's one of those things is i think i think a lot of times we think okay You know, I've got a couple thousand acres of barley. I've got a thousand acres of spring wheat, blah, blah, blah. This is my cereal acre. I'm going to go into my egg retail and and ask them for whatever is the cheapest. And I'm going to, you know, just just spray with that. Where where continuing to to scout, to look at those individual fields, um, to know the histories um, of those fields and maybe, you know, maybe I can cut back and, you know, and, and spray something that's, that's more cost effective on X, Y, and Z fields. But, um, you know, these fields over here were, wow, we, we, we don't want to let, we don't want to create the opportunity for weed escapes. Um, because that, you know, then you're working backwards, I feel. Um, so anytime we can prevent something and it's, it's really those, you know, Instead of driving by those those fields, stopping and getting out, you know, what are my top five weeds on these fields? You know, are are the wild oats as much of a problem here? You know, all of the all of the things. You know, are these groups that I'm going to be using, even though they're they're a little bit cheaper, are they effective on the weed spectrum that I'm seeing? You know, and really dialing that in. So it sounds like the joke we have around here, Derwin, is, you know, is it the scout at 60K scout or is it the actual scout that you did when you're doing it? Um, it's, it's, it sounds like actually from, from this perspective, the, the best option is to actually make sure because there may be some savings, not necessarily in price of product, but just what gets sprayed and, and what can be left in the jug, not even on the field. For sure. I, I think in the... A in a season where the crop is generally under stress, that's where understanding the individual individual field situation is that much more important because there, there may be opportunities on some fields where a certain portion of your weed spectrum isn't present um, to, to alter or, or cut out some of that tank mix combination that you were planning. Uh, but on other fields, it can be really critical. I deal a lot with uh, canola, soybeans, and corn in my area. And so, you know, canola and corn notorious for being stressed by early weed pressure, right? So getting out there and doing an early and effective job of your weed control, adding stress to those plants in a stressful season is, is not going to benefit them. So, you know, the drought stress is one part of that, but additional stress from other factors. We talked about not cutting back too much on fertility. This is another one of those situations where keeping those plants stress-free is only going to help them. Corn's a good example. If you get that mat of weeds in a V1, V2 corn crop, you can see the stunting of that plant height for the rest of the season in a lot of cases. And if you're hampering that above ground biomass, it's that photosynthetic capacity that drives your below ground biomass of your root system as well, right? So if you, you know, having an effective root system is going to be key in a drought season, right? Accessing whatever moisture and nutrients that plant can. So, you know, that, that early and effective weed control is really critical. 
Well, and then I think, Jenny, you know, okay, we, we get that early and effective weed control. Um, and so maybe we don't necessarily skimp there in terms of price. We make sure that it's done right. But I would think in, in, in droughty conditions here, we're probably, we, we maybe can forecast some savings in terms of, um, you know, fungicide treatments because we disease pressure, theoretically, of course, it's not necessarily, you've, we've still got to go scout to see it. But theoretically, um, you know, we're, we're probably expecting disease pressure to be lower. Absolutely. You know, um, I actually, in my country, I get excited when I get to recommend a fungicide, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things is, is yeah, when we've, when, you know, the taps turned on, you know, there is, there is in increased, you know, uh, yield potential, but also we, we really need to manage that. And that often, you know, translates into a fungicide application somewhere. Um, we've got a lot of pulse crops, around here, uh, chickpeas and lentils, we're often doing a, you know, a fungicide on if we've got any kind of, of decent moisture. So it is one of those things where, where, yeah, is, you know, I, I, I didn't cut back on, on the herbicide in crop. Um, but yeah, the fungicide could be scratched, you know, and that's a, that's a big cost for sure. And so I, 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 you know, personally, I, I like that idea that, okay, if I, if I look after this in this stage, then maybe I can, you know, better protect and better save it down the road and, and, and obviously have some cost savings there. So we've talked a lot about, you know, different, different ways we can manage this risk. Um, you know, Der Derwin, is there anything else in terms of, you know, how we might be able to manage risk? you know, not necessarily in one particular stage, but kind of the whole growing season to, you know, just kind of lay out that, you know, if if it does get, um, you know, wet, we get some rain, we will be able to take advantage of that, but we're not necessarily putting every dollar out, um, you know, in case in case things do stay tough or get worse. Well, certainly. We're, we're a company that's pretty focused on traits around pest protection against various pests. And, and so certainly among the various hybrids for various crops there there is tolerance to to different pests that you may deal with so you've always got to look at the cost of that particular trait and relative to the other hybrids that you might be looking at and comparing that against relying solely on a on a crop protection tool as an option but in a lot of cases if we do get into a situation we aren't anticipating where the the disease risk is elevated because we get that moisture in season. That's a good news story because it means we're not dealing with drought anymore. <laughs> but it, but uh, you know that trait's still going to help in terms of the overall performance of that crop against that pest. Um, whether we need to add a crop protection option over the top as well uh, or not, depending on what our scouting reveals as far as that pest pressure is. So, you know, it's certainly something to, to keep in mind as you head into the season. Um, there may be some opportunities where it, heading into a drier potential season, you know, that background level of protection that a trade offers could be sufficient to get you through with, without that, that need for, for a foliar rescue. What about from your perspective, Jenny? What what other things can we be thinking of to maybe make sure we're we're managing all the risks associated with this? So Derwin just made me think of um, a really important tool that that has been really successful for us on our canola acre in southern Alberta um, is is putting that lumiderm seed treat on the seed. Um, you know, um, there's a, a little bit of apprehension because it is pricey, but um, the past number of dry years, the flea beetle populations are just unreal. Um, and, and a number of mustard and canola crops have had to, you know, guys have had to go in with an, with an you know, intervene with a, a foliar application where, you know, the guys I say, if you're growing canola, or even mustard for that matter, we, we need Lumiderm on the seed. It will save you. And, um, you know, I don't have to convince growers of that now. It's, it's been a game changer for us. Um, we're, we're all of a sudden, we're managing the, 
the flea beetles, you know, the plants are growing out of it where, you know, they're able to, to grow and, and thrive instead of, you know, you know, getting their, um, becoming shredded, shredded little doilies. Um, you know, so it's, it's been one of those things where, yeah, the upfront cost is more, but, um, you know, you're not getting a call from your agronomist early in season saying, you know, you need to go spray this field. You've got to, you know, guys have enough on their plates where, where that addition of that seed treat has, has really been a game changer for us in Southern Alberta. Well, it sounds like, you know, from, from that perspective and actually all of these that we've talked about today, it sounds like some really great strategies that can, that can balance this, you know, tough decision of, you know, is it going to stay dry? How do, how do we manage costs and make sure we don't get too carried away? But at the same time, if the rain comes, we're there and we're ready to take advantage of it because, you know, it, it certainly is one that we're, we're hopeful. It, it, it's got to come sometime. It's just kind of managing, you know, as you've both, as you've both done really well today, managing that risk in case it doesn't. So Derwin, Jenny, thanks very much for joining the podcast today. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Andrew. That was a great, a great discussion, you know, and it's, it's always nice to talk to, to like-minded people where, you know, Hey, what, what's going on? What are you guys doing? You know? So thank you. That does it for this episode of the podcast. Don't forget, you can actually go back through our whole library of episodes, either in your podcast app or at the website pioneer.com slash Canada and check under the podcast section of the tools and services header. You'll find everything in there from more agronomy advice to episodes on financial management, agriculture policy, and more. You can also follow Pioneer Seeds on Twitter at the handle Pioneer Seeds CA or my personal handle Fresh Air Farmer. And don't forget, if you're ever looking for more information or advice, just ask your local Pioneer rep or visit pioneer.com Canada.